is the webinar to introduce the Wyoming Youth Wanna Be Gay Tool, the beta version. Um, this is a webinar, um, a live webinar for those individuals who are particularly interested in field testing and providing functional and technical review. And um, we welcome anybody else who's looking in just uh, out of interest. We, we are, are able, able to host, host more individuals, more individuals than we thought we would be able to. So, um, again, again, welcome. welcome. Uh, Age, I just, I just wanted to Age, before yeah. you continue, the feedback is really bad and it's difficult to understand you. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm hearing, hearing it too. too. Julia, why don't you want to, you sound pretty good. You want to finish the welcome and kind of do those slides just for the sake of clarity? Um, well, I will I will give Paige a moment to um, jump on and give her introduction because I believe that she has specific things that she wanted to say that I don't have in front of me. Um, but I, I will say welcome to everybody to this webinar for the Wyoming Stream Quantification Tool Data Version. Are folks hearing me all right, or is there feedback on my line as well? Yours is good. Okay, great. So um, Paige is going to talk a little bit about um, how we got to the to this point in developing the stream quantification tool. But um, I will just start out by saying that the Wyoming Stream Quantification Tool um, beta version is out for public notice for beta testing, field testing, public comment, and review. And we really appreciate your guys' time today on this webinar and we appreciate um, any feedback that you guys have on this version of the tool to help us improve it um, for the, the implementation version of the tool. Um, the tool is modified from a tool that was developed originally by Will Harmon and Stream Mechanics um, with funding from the Environmental Defense Fund in North Carolina. Um, and we have regionalized this tool for Wyoming and the regionalization, there's two aspects of regionalization. One is that the tool includes a suite of metrics that we believe are relevant to Wyoming and to the stream resources in Wyoming. And then the other aspect is that um, we have regionalized the tool in using regional data sets and Wyoming specific data sets to develop the performance standards and index values that sit within the tool to provide the functional scoring within the tool. So some metrics, particularly, um, for example, those in biology, are tied to specific protocols and species assemblages in Wyoming. Um, and some performance standards are informed by broader data sets from the adjoining states um, within the same ecoregions as the ones in Wyoming um, or the same stream types as the one in Wyoming. So um, we've really tried to focus the tool on being representative of the stream resources that we have in Wyoming. And so I think that feedback um, during the public comment period on aspects of the regionalization and you know things that we may need to include for a Wyoming relevant tool would be all very useful. And I'll just check in to see if Paige is back on the line. Yeah, I think I might have uh, resolved my problem. Can you hear it me? Sounds, more? It sounds excellent, Paige. Okay, great, great. Well, thanks, Julia, for, for covering those, uh, those introductory tidbits. Um, we, uh, I just wanted to, to kind of give you a sense of um, how we got here real briefly. In 2013, the Wyoming Regulatory Office, uh, Corps of Engineers, and the Wyoming uh, Interagency Review Team, which is the, a team of uh, interagency uh, technical folks that um, assist with um, the review of uh, mitigation banks and in the fee programs, um, developed a, a stream technical work group um, and we uh, came up with um, a policy document called the Wyoming Stream Mitigation Procedure. And uh, that's basically a method for calculating debits and, and credits associated with stream impacts and mitigation projects, um, associated with mitigation projects and, and, and uh, Department of the Army permitted projects. Um, and uh, we, we quickly realized that, um, that the mitigation procedure was based on very 
qualitative methods um, that really weren't uh, meeting the needs of uh, what was intended uh, for, for assessing uh, losses and gains of stream functions uh, as required by the 2008 mitigation rule. And so what we did was um, our stream technical group um, with financial assist and technical assistance in EPA, Region 8, i.e. Julia, <laughs> Um, we partnered with um, Will Harmon at Stream Mechanics uh, to adapt that North Carolina version of the tool that Julia had mentioned. Um, and it's, it's adapted for specific use in Wyoming ecosystems, um, but to meet uh, Corps of Engineer regulatory needs. And so um, this tool that's out for beta um, testing will quantitatively assess loss and lift of stream functions and it'll serve as the technical foundation um, of the policy document, which is the Wyoming Stream Mitiga Mitigation Procedure. So I just wanted to provide that, that reference, that point of reference uh, for how it ties into our program and uh, the need that we saw um, for this particular tool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Julia and Will to kind of go through um, uh, the tool itself and the user manual that accompanies it. So Julia, maybe before you do your slide, I'll just point out um, for those that do want to play with, with the quantification tool that you can get, get the quantification tool itself, the spreadsheet from the Stream Mechanics webpage. And there's a lot of supporting information there as well. So in a few minutes, we'll go over the stream functions pyramid framework very briefly, but all of that kind of background uh, supporting information is on this web page. And the so Julia, notice. you want to talk about the agenda and then the user manual? Mm -hmm. So today we are going to just provide a very brief overview of what's in the user manual and the spreadsheet tool. Uh, Will is going to provide an overview of the stream functions pyramid framework as background um, and then also provide a tour of the Wyoming stream quantification tool spreadsheet and we will also touch on some key points for field data collection to inform the tool. Um, so the, the tool does many things. And depending on what your intended use, um, certain aspects of the user manual may, may be very relevant to you and others may be less relevant to you. Um, the tool can be used for several different things. Um, the tool can be used for restoration project planning, assisting in site selection, determining the restoration potential of a, rest, of a restoration site. And also it can be used to help set function-based goals and objectives for a restoration project. The output of the tool is um, a functional foot score, and this functional foot score um, can be used to compare pre and post project scores so that you can look at the delta or the change between a pre and a post project condition. And that's referred to as the functional list if you have an increase in your functional score or functional loss, which is a decrease in your functional score. Um, and so um, the user manual goes through, it's organized by background first. So it provides background on the stream functions pyramid framework and the Wyoming stream quantification tool. Also in chapter one, it talks about how to enter data into the spreadsheet. So it talks about what data you may need in order to complete the spreadsheet. And then it's organized by whether you're evaluating a project for functional lift, so a gain at a restoration or a mitigation site, or whether you're using the tool to determine functional loss or um, the impact at a permitted impact site. So chapter two covers how to use the stream quantification tool for restoration and mitigation projects. Chapter three provides information for how to use the tool to inform Clean Water Act permitting and determine what your impacts might be at a project site. And then chapter four provides um, data on how to collect field data for the to inform the Wyoming stream quantification tool. And this chapter four includes both detailed and rapid met, uh, methods that can be collected for metrics. And it outlines 
what data you need to collect in the field, what data you can collect remotely um, from a desktop exercise. And then we've taken all the rapid methods from chapter four and consolidated the, them into an appendix uh, to make field data collection a little bit simpler for those that are just going out to do a rapid assessment of a site. And that appendix A includes a description of the rapid methods and it also includes the field form, some field forms that you could use to fill out for the tool. So one thing with this diagram, this diagram is in the user manual and, and one purpose is to help people not feel overwhelmed when they see the page numbers. So it is about a hundred page document, but really use this as your guide. You don't, unless you just want to, you don't necessarily have to sit down and read this manual from cover to cover. You can go to the chapters that, that pertain to what you're about to do. Um, and then at the very bottom of this slide, there is a frequently asked questions um, document in Appendix B. And as we're looking for comments and questions on the tool, I really strongly recommend that you read these, this frequently asked questions first, because it could be that some of those questions have already been answered. Anything else, Julia? Well, if you go to the next slide, I can cover that really quick before you jump into the pyramid. Perfect. So the Wyoming Stream Quantification Tool is an Excel workbook um, and Will will go into a little bit more detail on how to determine how many um, workbooks you may need for a project site. But basically each workbook is for one reach and the workbook contains seven worksheets, um, project assessment, catchment assessment, quantification tool, performance standards, debit tool, monitoring data, and a monitoring summary. Uh, the primary data entry in the tool is the quantification tool spreadsheet, and I believe Will will walk you through all of these pieces. Um, but I just want to point out that the performance standard spreadsheet just shows folks how we derived the index values for the measurement methods that go into the tool. Um, so that isn't a spreadsheet that is editable. It is just one that is there for people's reference. Um, the tool also can be used for post-project monitoring and performance, and so the monitoring data and monitoring summary provide an opportunity to track up to 10 monitoring events post-project to see how the site performs over time. And now I will turn it over to Will, and we will get into the background on the Stream Functions Pyramid. All right, thanks, Julia. Yeah, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of background. And then we'll stop with PowerPoint and I'll crack open a spreadsheet, the quantification tool, and we'll enter some data together so you get a feel for, for how the spreadsheet works. <clears throat> um, as Paige mentioned, the, the quantification tool is based on the Stream Functions Pyramid Framework. I'm not going to go into detail on what that is, but there is a document on the Stream Mechanics webpage, uh, as well as actually EPA's webpage and the Fish and Wildlife Service that will give you that background. I just want to pull out some of the key terms from there that you will see in the quantification tool. So this is that stream functions pyramid. It essentially is just a, a hierarchy, a, a graphic that shows that these lower level functions support higher level functions. We use it in a stream restoration context to help us determine if we want to improve certain functions, what supporting functions need to be in place to do that. We pull some of this language, these terms, right into the quantification tool. So one is functional category. You will see that term in the user manual. You'll see it used in the quantification tool. So hydrology, hydraulics, geomorphology, physical, chemical, and biology are, are the five functional categories that are included in the quantification tool. And then within each of these categories is a functional statement. So the functional statement itself doesn't make its way into the quantification tool, but it is important to remember this because we're going to talk about metrics and we have some different definitions for metrics. These metrics are organized by these categories and the real purpose of the metrics, whether it's a conditional metric or an actual function is to help us understand, describe, quantify these functional statements. And so within the, the framework itself, we pull out these different terms. So for metric, we 
we have um, what we call function-based parameters. So they are attached to each of those functional categories. You'll see a list of parameters when we get to the tool. And then attached to the parameters are measurement methods. So one thing that's important to remember is that, well, a couple things. One, there, there can be more than one parameter within a functional category. And then for each parameter, there can be more than one measurement method quantifying that parameter. And then attached to each of these measurement methods, this is where the scoring begins to occur. So we have performance standards and performance standard curves that put these metrics into buckets of functioning, functioning at risk, and not functioning. Within this, as we took this concept and began to put it um, to create those performance standards, to create this sort of idea of functioning, functioning at risk, and not functioning, we needed we needed to know what reference condition was. And reference condition can, can kind of mean different things depending on the literature that you're looking at. So for this tool, for the framework and the tool, met a, a reference condition means that the measurement method that we're quantifying is fully functioning. And it's fully functioning like an unaltered system or minimally impacted. Sometimes we like to use the word pristine but it's not a great word because what is pristine you know all of this can be a little bit tricky but it really is meaning as 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 unaltered as possible it's different than best attainable and this becomes very important as we play out how the tool gets used what we do as a practitioner on a site to achieve best attainable for that site may still not be functioning like a reference condition. And so you'll see how that, how that plays out with the scoring as we move forward. So one thing we had to do with the quantification tool is put a scale to this notion of not functioning up through functioning. So we used a scale of zero to one and zero to 0 0.29 is not functioning. 0.3 to 0.69 is middle of the road, functioning at risk. And then 0.7 to 1 would be functioning like a reference condition. And so, if, in other words, if you had 0.7, you could think of that as 70% of that unaltered condition. But the 0.7 to 1 really representing that unaltered reference condition category. Okay, from the framework, we also pulled over a concept mm -hmm. called restoration potential. And we have to, we have to, state what the restoration potential is within the quantification tool. So the definition of restoration potential is the highest level of restoration that can be achieved based on watershed conditions, and there is a watershed condition assessment in the tool, results of our function-based assessment on the reach, and then any project constraints that we may have. When we say highest level, we mean the highest level on that pyramid. And it generally is gonna be a three for geomorphology, a four for physicochemical, or a five for biology. But our ability to get there really depends on these three things. What's going on in our reach, what's going on in the watershed, and any constraints that we have. So you can see in the picture example here, the picture on the left is in the Wood River we have a very nice watershed draining to this reach, a nice reach as well. And so the restoration potential here would be very high, whereas the project on the right is in a, in a more degraded watershed, degraded reach. There's a lot of cattle influence to the stream here, and there's a lot of cattle and grazing in the watershed. And so even if you fix the reach with what's going on in the upstream upper part of the watershed, your restoration potential may still not be to bring biology back to a reference condition. So to help figure this out within the spreadsheet, there is a sheet that is the catchment assessment form. It is the most qualitative um, scoring that we have in the tool. It really, it, its primary purpose is really to help with this notion of restoration potential. And so it includes a variety of questions about the watershed conditions and stressors that could limit functional lift 
and therefore restoration potential. So a couple of key things here. One is that it's, it's looking at stressors outside of your reach, outside of the things that you can control as part of a restoration project. Things that are mostly upstream of you, but could be downstream as well, that it's limiting that restoration potential. So I also mentioned constraints. So we have a very specific take on constraints here. So the constraints need to be human caused constraints. So things like sewer lines that are running next to the stream or crossing the stream, an easement boundary, you know, if it was a mitigation project and someone was thinking about putting a conservation easement on that, but the, the width of the easement was much less than the width of the valley because of existing land uses, roads, uh, land uses such as cropland, those would all be things that are constraining the practitioner from getting the highest level of restoration potential. Natural conditions are not included in this tool as a constraint. So it certainly is possible that we could have a big bedrock nick point, a waterfall, for example, that might be a fish barrier, but it would not be a constraint. It's a natural condition that affects the biology in that watershed, not an anthropogenic stressor. So we're very careful to, to tease out natural conditions versus the human cause constraints. It doesn't mean that in a narrative we couldn't describe any natural condition that may prevent certain species of fish, for example, from, from inhabiting our reach, but it is not considered a constraint. So then the final part of this is just the restoration potential results. And again, in the spreadsheet, there's a place for the practitioner to pick level five biology, which means they believe the restoration potential is to bring biology back to a reference condition Physical chemical would be a water quality piece. This is typically specific to small headwater systems, maybe even urban, where people are doing some land use changes to affect runoff and nutrients, maybe for, as an example. Um, and then level three is the geomorphology, which is the, the stability and habitat. So probably the majority of stream restoration projects are down here in the level three. They have great restoration potential to create a stable channel to bring back habitat because habitat is in geomorphology not biology aquatic life is biology however level three restoration potential could improve biology but just not back to a reference condition so maybe it takes biology from not functioning to functioning at risk that would still be level three Okay, so in just a minute, I'm going to stop the PowerPoint and open up a spreadsheet and kind of enter some data and show you around. This organized the spreadsheet a little bit for you. So you can see when we, when we open up that workbook, there's a project assessment worksheet. And this is a place where you can select your programmatic goals, add your reach description, you can insert an aerial photograph of the project, and then you can write and talk about your restoration potential. The next sheet is the catchment assessment form. And there's quite a bit of explanation in the user manual about this catchment assessment form. We do recommend people complete the entire form. Uh, unless there's something that doesn't apply. I mean, it's not a scoring, so you actually could not answer a question if you felt like it wasn't applicable and there's even a place where you can add categories if you need to but really its primary purpose is to help determine that restoration potential and then third is the quantification tool so this is really the heart and soul of of the of the spreadsheet it's a place where you can put your site information your performance standard stratification and it's where you enter your data first your existing condition field values and then your proposed condition field values. There's also, as Julia mentioned, a monitoring data sheet. So this is where you can you first put in your as-built condition, and then there are up to 10 monitoring events that can be entered. And then there's a data summary sheet that takes the information from the monitoring data sheet and displays it in table form and graphic form. There's a debit tool sheet that is used for, on the impact side. So it, and there's a whole chapter in the user manual on how to use this. 
the debit tool as a calculator is built right into the quantification tool. And then there's a performance standard sheet. So we've, we've tried to make this very transparent. So as we've developed performance curves for each of the metrics, we've put them right in the spreadsheet and made that available. And then later this fall, we'll be, begin writing a document that, that describes or explains the rationale used to get from actual data to the performance standard curves. So again, before I crack open the spreadsheet, I'll just, just a little bit about the parameters. So in the user manual, you'll see that there's always the recommendation to include these parameters, reach runoff, floodplain connectivity, bed form diversity, riparian vegetation, lateral stability, and sinuosity. And within these, when you get to the policy side, there will be some recommendations on kind of a what kind of quality needs to be achieved for at least floodplain connectivity, bed form diversity, riparian vegetation, and lateral stability before lift is calculated. As you will see, this is primarily a lift tool. So if you were concerned that restoration potential was, you may only get through level three, that's okay because once you get a minimum quality, the tool is all about the lift, all about the delta. And if you look at these metrics, and, I, and I'm not going into much detail about what these metrics mean, they are all explained in the user manual. I know some of you, these are pretty common terms. For others, you may need to, to read a little bit to get the, exactly what we're talking about here. But these are metrics that practitioners can manipulate and change as part of a restoration project. They have quite a bit of control over whether these metrics are gonna be performing well or not. It's not limited as much by the watershed condition as things like macroinvertebrates and fish and water quality. So as we kind of look at that picture, there's a before and after picture here. Many of these metrics were manipulated to get that picture from the before to the after. So one thing we're really trying to do with this tool is to make that link between what people are doing on the site, the activity, so to speak, but the activity, the purpose of an activity is to manipulate a function to get a response. And so we're really trying to, to improve that communication linkage so that it's not just an activity-based exercise, that the activity is tied to a change in function. We also mention, you know, just other common parameters. So there is guidance in the manual on what parameters you may choose. So the ones in bold um, are common if you were going to assess up through level five, which is biology. We also have rapid methods for assessing these parameters. And then you can see we added here some nutrients, macrobenthos, and fish to get through level four and level five. And then there are other parameters that may be selected based on a scenario. So, you know, if I was doing this in North Carolina, we would make large woody debris required because the entire state is forested. But that's not the case for Wyoming. So large woody debris is not required for every project, but you would use it if you were working in one of the forested regions. Bed material may be selected for projects where we believe that that project could change the grain size distribution, maybe make it coarser. Temperature for cold and cool water streams. And then flow alteration for projects that, that have the potential to change the base flow. All right, so I'm gonna pause here for just a second and I'm gonna move into the quantification tool Okay, so this is uh, the quantification tool. 
the first tab, as we talked about, is the project assessment tab. So I, this is just a place where you could enter in, you know, most of you are going to be testing the tool, I believe, you know, on a restoration side, which might be like the mitigation side. So there's a place here for you to um, select your programmatic goals. Maybe the purpose of this project ultimately is to get mitigation or mitigation credits. There's a place for you to describe your reach, um, you know, your programmatic goals, the restoration potentials, if it's on the impact side, a place to describe the impacts, and so on. The next sheet is the catchment assessment form. So I went ahead and, and just filled this out. You can see I, all the data that I'm going to put in here are I just made up. I'm just entering data in so that we have something to use as an example. And since I was making it up, I went with a really good watershed. So you can see there are questions in here, a variety of categories. It just puts it into to columns of, of poor, fair, good. You can rate that here. So you can see mostly G's, but here's one poor, a couple more goods, a fair, a poor, a good. So then I just use my best professional judgment in this case to say, I believe the overall watershed condition is good. This is a drop down. I could have picked poor, fair, good. And so, you know, again, since this is an example, I went big. So I said our restoration potential here is a level five biology because the watershed above the project will support biology to a reference condition if I can fix the problems at the REACH scale. That's essentially what that's saying. So the next sheet is the quantification tool. As we mentioned, this is really the, the heart and soul of, of the quantification tool. You'll spend your most time here. And so let's just kind of together, I'm going to go through here and add and fill this out so you can see what that process would be. So for a project name, I'm just going to put example, a reach ID, we'll put one. And for these lighter blue cells, this is a drop down menu. So I'm going to select this. And because of that catchment assessment score, I'm going to say my restoration potential is level five. What that also means is that I'm going to include metrics in level four and level five. There's a place for the existing stream type that is really just a communication tool. It's not used to help select performance standards. Um, so I'm going to say that our existing stream type is a G little c. I'm going to go with a C for our reference stream type. Now this, this selection is important because this is linking to the performance standard sheet. Yeah, I got a request to zoom in a little bit, so here we go. Um, this selection is linking to the performance standard sheet, and so some of these metrics are stratified by stream type. And that's what this table is telling the tool. When we make these selections, it's telling us, all right, So then the next one will be ecoregions. So we have mountains. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. The next will be bioregion. So I'm going to select um, the high valleys. And then drainage area is a place for us to enter that value. So I'm going to put 20 square miles. All right, so let me zoom, I guess. All right, I'll zoom out a little bit. I don't, I don't want to zoom out too much so that people can't see. I will scroll over so you can see different parts of the screen once I get more information entered. All right, so for proposed bed material, we're going to do gravel and cobble. And then a plate, I'm just going to put in a thousand feet for the existing stream type, 1,200 for the proposed slope as a percent. So we're going to put half a percent. And then the river basin, we're going to pick the green river. Stream temperature, 
We'll do a tier one for cold, the riparian soil texture, sandy. The vegetation cover should be forested. I'm gonna leave the stream productivity rate uh, cell blank because we're not doing this particular project for the purpose of supporting a game fishery. And for the valley type, we'll do an un, a confined alluvial valley. So again, all, the purpose of this part is not so much just to give us some reach information, but each of these rows is telling the tool which performance standard to use for a variety of metrics. So once we get this filled out, we're ready to start entering data. If I scroll over, you can see when we get finished, this table is going to be populated. And then all of these parameters will be populated as well. And you can see right now we're getting a warning because we have not provided the minimum requirements for the, we have not provided data for the minimum amount of requirements. All right, so now we'll start entering the existing conditions. So I'll scroll out just a little bit so you can see where the field value is going. And you'll see as I enter field values, there'll be an index value and a parameter. All right, so I said from my catchment assessment that we had a good watershed. So I'm going to go kind of middle of the road. This, this, is fair, this is the one kind of qualitative metric in the tool. So based on that catchment assessment, we're saying that we had a good hydrology component from that value. It gets entered here. The next parameter is a reach runoff metric. It was one of the ones that we recommend that's always included. So I'm going to enter a value for the curve number. This is runoff that's coming from adjacent land uses between the upstream and downstream end. Uh, we're going to add some concentrated flow points, and I'm not going to do soil compaction for this. So you can see there are three measurement methods for this one parameter. I'm also not doing flow alteration for this particular example because we don't think we're going to be changing the flow alteration for this. All right, so for floodplain connectivity, we have two parameters. We're going to do a two for bank height ratio, a one for the entrenchment ratio. Since it is forested, we're going to do the large weed debris index. I'm going to jam in a 220. We're going to do lateral stability. I'm going to enter values for a dominant B high near bank stress. We're going to say we have some bank erosion. So that's kind of our magnitude. <clears throat> and we'll say we have 30% erosion. So we have a variety of measurement methods for the riparian vegetation. A lot of these are split by left and right. So I'm just going to put in a 5 for the left riparian width ratio, a 30 for the right. For cover, I'm going to do a zero on the left, and we'll do 25 on the right. Herbaceous, maybe 15 and 50. Non-native, let's go 25 and 10. Hydrophytic vegetation, zero and zero. And then for stem density, we'll do a five and a 10. And the green line, we'll do a five. So you can see these are the field values. As these field values get put in, it's returning an index score for each measurement method. Those measurement methods are averaging these values to get a parameter average. And then for, for the category, these parameters are being averaged to give a category score. So we're not going to do bed material for this example. And I'll scroll down, and for our pool spacing, we're going to do an 8 for the spacing. For this is one, you will enter all three for pool spacing, pool depth, percent riffle. I'm not going to do the aggradation ratio here because we didn't see signs of aggradation, and we're going to say that existing sinuosity is quite straight. 
So now, since we said we were going to go through five, I'm going to go. I'm going to enter data for four, uh, level four and level five. So I'm going to pick the seven-day average for the temperature. We said it was a cold water stream, but we didn't have. Maybe we have a little bit of impairment. So I'm going to put a 17. I didn't go too bad here because since I have a good watershed, maybe the reach has opened up. But if we have a pretty good watershed, it, it shouldn't be too bad. I'll put a little bit of, of we're using chlorophyll as our measurement method for nutrients. And then we'll add some values for our macroinvertebrates. And then our fish. We're going to do number of native fish species percent as expected that were found. And then we'll also include um, the species of, of, let's see, I think what that's called, of greatest conservation need. And that'll be a category two. And so now if we scroll back up, you can see it has populated our existing condition parameters. And it's filled out the existing condition score of 0.33. So we're essentially functioning at 33% of reference condition. We have our stream length um, <clears throat> for existing and proposed. So now I'm going to come down and just enter some uh, proposed values. So the vast majority of the time, your catchment health hydrology will stay the same. So I'm not going to change that value. But for the curve number, maybe we do some things as a restoration activity to improve the runoff adjacent to our site. So I'm going to change that curve number to 60. And I'm going to say that we're going to get rid of any concentrated flow points that are coming into the stream. For floodplain connectivity, we're going to make the stream not incised anymore. We're going to connect it to its floodplain. We're going to add some wood. We're going to prepare the site so that we have uh, less bank erosion. So I'm going to, and this will be the proposed value. So this is, these are the values we expect the site to achieve at the end of monitoring. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume a five-year monitoring here. And then we'll say 5% by the end of monitoring for erosion. And then for our riparian vegetation, we'll expand that riparian width. We would expect to see some woody vegetation cover by the end of monitoring, some herbaceous cover, maybe some non-native plants do come in. We have a little bit. We have hydrophytic vegetation. We have the stem density. And then the green line stability rating. So this is what we expect to be at by year five. Then we have our bed form diversity. So we'll put in that we are improving that pool spacing, pool depth, percent ruffle pool. Maybe we're going to increase sinuosity a little bit. We wouldn't increase it too much because it's a confined alluvial valley. We're also pretty short. I don't know that we'd have a big change in temperature, but maybe we move the needle just a little bit. We get the cows out of the stream. Maybe we improve the nutrients. We see a response. Because we have made these changes to the reach and because our watershed is good and will support it, we do see a response in biology. And I understand that as you're watching these, these just look like numbers. So that's okay. I just want you to get familiar with the spreadsheet. Again, the user manual does describe the measurement method that does describe how to go out and collect this data. So if we scroll back up, a couple of things you can see. One is that the proposed parameters all match the existing parameters. That's very important. You can't cherry pick the parameters you want to assess on the existing and the parameters you want to assess in the proposed. Since this is primarily a delta tool, we have to use the same parameters on the existing and the proposed side. You'll see that there were two parameters that we did not assess. I primarily, for the example, left two out for two reasons. One, I wanted to make the point 
that if you do not assess a parameter, it is simply removed from the tool. It is not a zero. And then also, you, you may not have to, you may not actually assess every parameter for every site. So if we scroll back up, you can see now we have our table with our functional change. And so the primary method of lift is this proposed functional foot minus the existing functional foot. So you can see this project has 702 additional functional feet after restoration than before. So I'm going to skip over here to the monitoring data. And, and I'm not, this has already been filled out. So I just want to make you aware of this spreadsheet. So you can see there's a place to put in, and I'll just kind of scroll out a little bit. There's a place for you to put your ads built. And then you can put in what the monitoring year is. So I just put in five years. You, if you skipped years, you could put one, three, you know, and so on. So this, all of this gets rolled over to the data summary sheet. And so here, the first view here is a table. And you can see this is the existing. It brings over from, the, from that worksheet. Here's the proposed. And now I went ahead and populated the as-built through year five. You can look at it in tabular form. Or if you come down here, you can see these are the functional foot values, both the overall condition score and the functional foot values. But I think what's important, primarily of importance, at least from a thinking about future crediting, would be we had 350 functional feet before restoration. We are proposing 1,044 by year five. But you'll see that with the as-built that you're not there. The as-built functional foot is certainly better than the existing, <clears throat> but the site has to mature some, especially with things like riparian vegetation and then even the level four and five metrics before we would get there. So since I made the data up, I have us hitting our 1044 at year five, which is when we would propose we would do it with that proposed condition score but you can see their trajectory over time. If we look at that as a graph, you can kind of see it. So here's the existing condition score. Here's the as-built score. Here's the proposed condition score. And then the black line is our monitoring. So year one, we are a little better than our as-built. Year two, not much change. Between year two and three, Maybe the vegetation is starting to become more established. The herbaceous vegetation is more established. Our stability ratings are improving. And then we kind of hold flat through four. And then between four and five, maybe our woody vegetation starts to do better. The site has had time to equilibrate. So the, the biology begins to respond to this change and we do achieve our, our proposed condition score by year five. This, I need to fix this. You can kind of ignore this line. You're seeing this because it's pulling the zeros from the table here. We need to fix that in the spreadsheet so it just plots what has actually been monitored. So just to finish the tour, here's the performance standard sheet. So I'm not going to spend time going through all of this. It is organized by the categories. So there's hydrology, hydraulics, and so on. And as you scroll down, you can see the different performance curves. And then I'm going to go back just quickly. Here's the debit tool. So if you are working on the functional loss side, the debit tool is built into this spreadsheet. I just put an example. It pulled from that existing stream, where I used the same existing stream length. I made that proposed stream length a little bit lower. I picked a tier three impact severity. So that's really all I had to do here for that option, and it did the rest of the math for me. So when you're reading through the debit tool, it may seem like a lot, but a lot of, a lot of the math is built in, into the tool. All right, so we're almost done. I'm going to switch over. Before we do questions, I'm going to switch over and just finish a few tips on the um, data collection to get some of that information, and then we'll open it up.
Okay. So I just wanted to make a couple of, of points about, you know, especially for those of you that are going to be playing with the tool in the coming months as you go out into the field, a few things that we expect or suspect that there will be questions about are kind of the reach selection. <clears throat> for those of you that are familiar with bank height and entrenchment ratios, we have a bit of a twist on that. So I just wanted to make you aware of that twist. Talk about a couple of nuances with bed form diversity. Um, this new riparian width uh, and vegetation ratio, or riparian width ratio, and a little bit on vegetation. And then just wanted to remind everybody that the rapid method forms are in Appendix A. So if you want to go out and start playing, you will want to get that form. Uh, the spreadsheet version of that form is on my webpage. So if you want to download that so you can begin to enter data, <clears throat> that should work well. All right, so we'll do reach selection first. So be sure and read section 4.2 in the user manual. There is, there's, it's basically a two-step process. So step number one is you're going to delineate the reach from a big picture perspective, the landscape kind of view. And then once that reach has been delineated, you're going to do a sub-reach delineation that's, that's driven by the requirements of the individual metric. So for the big picture reach delineation, you will use things like similar valley and stream type to help make that decision, breaks at major confluences, uh, similar stability and functional condition, similar influence of riparian vegetation, similar bed material like gravel, cobble versus sand, uh, breaks by restoration potential and approach. So in other words, if you think you may have one section that's a, a restoration potential three, and maybe somewhere else um, it is higher, maybe upstream, then <clears throat> you could you might want to have those breaks. That would be a little bit unusual, actually. Anyway, so here's an example. This is uh, at Medicine Lodge. So I, stream is flowing this way. So if we were looking at this entire stretch of stream, you can see we have a confined valley here, confined valley here. These may be two reaches from a landscape perspective where they come together, we would have a third reach. And then you can see there's a section here where the stream is right against the hill slope and the road. There's kind of a wide valley on the right looking downstream, but the river and the road seem to be uh, kind of sharing uh, part of the valley anyway. So this could be a reach maybe from here to here. This is a section where the stream comes away from the road and actually picks up a diversion. So that might be a reach. And then we have a fairly long section below where you can see the stream is, is meandering. <clears throat> it's kind of meandering into this field. This may be a reach as well. I'm going to focus on this section as my example as we, as we keep moving forward. All right, so that's the, that's the landscape level reach delineation, but and that's, that's acknowledged here in step one. So this is your reach segmentation based on those physical characteristics, and that might be this red line. But within this, you may have different reach links depending on the metric that you're assessing. So the first thing to start with, at least for me, is I go 20 times the bankful width or two meander wavelengths if it's a meandering stream to get my primary sub reach length. And I'm gonna assess things like floodplain connectivity, lateral stability, bed material, bed form, and riparian vegetation within this sub reach. But then things like sinuosity, I may actually go and look at a longer reach, maybe even 40 times the bankful width as long as I stay within that overall reach limit. And then there are things like large woody debris that's assessed in a 100 meter segment. So I would pick that within the 20 times the bankful width reach. And all this is spelled out in the user manual. Just wanted to explain it here to help provide some clarity. So again, as an example, I zoomed in on the lower part of that Medicine Lodge Creek. So this would be that lower reach from here to here. That would be the overall reach. But you can see I have one, two meander wavelengths. 
I'm going to start at the beginning of a riffle, end at the beginning of a riffle. So this may be my sub reach where I'm doing the majority of my assessment. Next is that weighted bank height ratio and the entrenchment ratios. I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this. I just wanted everyone to, to know, especially those that are familiar with this, that we are, we are weighting these values. <clears throat> so for, to do that, we're measuring the bank height ratio and the entrenchment ratio at the midpoint of the riffle, and we're weighting it by the riffle length. And the reason that we're doing this is that there is an incentive in this tool for practitioners to pick the absolute worst bank height ratio on the existing side and the best bank height ratio on the proposed side. So this is standardizing how and where we're going to measure it by picking the middle of the riffle for every riffle and by looking at that riffle length is, is proportional, create, making a proportional um, score for that value. And so it's weighting it by that length. And that way, if you had one kind of high bank height ratio, but it was fairly short, it wouldn't, it wouldn't penalize you. That might occur, you know, if you were using part of a existing channel, a remnant channel, and it was moderately in size, but you wanted to use it, then it would show up. So it prevents cherry picking. It does also provide an overall reach assessment, and it, and it, on the entrenchment ratio side, it is a way to show that floodplain contraction and expansion that may be occurring uh, both in the existing condition and the, and the proposed. Maybe setback, maybe levees are removed, for example, so you get more floodplain inundation. So the next is the bed form diversity. Again, you can see section 4.8E in the user manual. There are four measurement methods. I just wanted to talk for a minute about the pool spacing ratio. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that there are some weaknesses with this metric. So we do not have performance standards as of today for braided systems, anastomose systems, or ephemeral systems. So if you're working in those, in those streams, then we don't have this stratified for those um, conditions yet. All right, the main point the main takeaway for this pool spacing ratio is that micro pools are not included in this metric. So for meandering streams, it's the lateral pools associated with the meander bends that are part of the pool spacing. So if we have a micro pool and a riffle, that is not counted for pool spacing. For steeper gradient systems like step pool streams, <clears throat> Like if we have a cascade pool or step pool, we're looking at the pool that's formed downstream of that major geomorphic structure. It does not include the micro pools in the cascade or the riffle. So as a figure example, for the meandering streams, this is what I mean. So we're talking about the pools and the outside of the meander bins. These get counted for pool spacing, but if there's a little backwater pool or pocket pool behind a boulder, that's not included in spacing, or if there's a piece of large weight debris that creates a pool here, that's not included as spacing either. For step pools, it's a similar concept. So if we have, say, a step, cascade, step, this would be the pool that's counted. Any kind of micro pool that's within the cascade is not counted for spacing. Next is the riparian width ratio. So this is a bit of a new idea that we're testing. So we are looking for, for your feedback and how well this works and what, what kinds of things are you experiencing, difficulties, for example, as you try to implement this. We are trying to tie the riparian width more to the geomorphology of the valley and not just a width that is associated with water quality like denitrification, for example. We use an observe over an expected value as a ratio. So the observed is the width of natural vegetation free from human activity. And then the expected is the width that is appropriate for that valley type. And we give two methods for doing expected. One is a flood prone width and the other is a meander width ratio. So here's the entrenchment ratio. Now this is a twist on an existing metric. So if the stream is not incised, we'll use the entrenchment ratio straight up, just, just the way that we do for floodplain connectivity. However, 
if the stream is in size so that the flood prone width would be within the channel, we're going to come to the top of the low bank and we're going to come up one times the bank full max depth and draw the line there to get the expected riparian area width. So again, this is only for incised channels and it's only for the riparian width, not the flood prone width that's used in floodplain connectivity. So I'm going to just provide some picture examples. So here's an example of the Wood River that is not incised. So we would use the straight up entrenchment ratio, just like we do in floodplain connectivity. And we can see that that flood prone width does in fact match the active floodplain, which we can tell by just looking at the riparian composition of the floodplain compared to the low terrace and the high terrace, that this flood prone width equals our riparian vegetation width because it is encompassing the full width of that floodplain. In this example, the stream is incised, so bank full is down here. You got this bench that's forming. So when you do two times the bank full depth, it comes up to the top of the bank on this side and this break and slope on this side. So while that is the correct answer for entrenchment ratio for purposes of floodplain connectivity, it is not the width of the it's not the riparian width that we want to use for assessment. So we would come to the top of the low bank and do one times the bank full width, basically assuming a bank height ratio of one, and that will give us a flood prone width that matches kind of the original floodplain width better than the current and sized width. And you can see it's not necessarily great riparian vegetation, but it is natural. It's free from roads or free from human activity. And then we did put one option in here for a meander width ratio method. I, I think this will only get used for huge sites or sites with huge floodplains where that in flood prone width may, may extend a lot wider than say the 50 year flood event. So I don't think it'll get used that often. This might have been a sample, this is back to Medicine Lodge, where that would apply if you're, if that using the entrenchment ratio method that took you all the way over here, since it's such a wide valley, you could go with that riparian width ratio and it would give you a more moderate width that's maybe more closely associated with your 50 year flood event rather than something like a 100 year flood event. We know that the 50 year flood event is geomorphically more significant than the 100 year event. Okay, so I am gonna stop there. Um, before we open it up, let me um, take people off mute. And I just wanna give Julia and Paige an opportunity if I missed anything critical or you wanna add anything to go ahead and do that before we take questions. Are you guys there? Julia, I'm here. I don't have anything to add before we go to Q&A. This is Paige. Um, uh, I could go over a couple um, tips on um, riparian vegetation data collection, or I could just let the questions kind of come up if anybody has questions. If you have something important that you think people should hear, Paige, why don't you go ahead and, and, um, and offer that up, and then that gives people a chance to be thinking of their questions while you do that. Okay. Will, would you mind going back to um, the spreadsheet that shows the list of uh, different measurement methods? And I've uh, been getting a few messages from folks uh, while we've been on the webinar here, um, uh, indicating that they've been having difficulty getting into and logging in on the web meeting. 
so I apologize for those difficulties. And I just wanted to remind anybody who's ha who happens to be just listening in um, that that this is being recorded and it will be posted on the Stream Mechanics website. Um, and uh, we can end this presentation uh, with that um, uh, web address uh, on screen so that you have it. You can also find it on the Corps of Engineers uh, Wyoming Regulatory Office website, um, the link to the public notice. The public notice contains um, all of the essential web links in that document. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, so I just wanted to, to review the, um, the measurement methods that are used to help document uh, changes in riparian vegetation. Uh, Will went over the um, riparian width ratio approach that we've used, um, which is a really great um, indicator for both uh, floodplain connectivity issues, um, stability, and uh, also uh, just um, the width, the functional width of um, the riparian corridor. Um, left and right, everything is broken out uh, uh, into left and right, except for green line stability, because that wraps in both banks. Um, because um, uh, in, in certain regulatory circumstances, uh, a, a permittee um, may have only access to one side of a bank and the other. And so we wanted to be able to account for that, or there may be very serious differences in uh, management or protection. And so um, it looks very cumbersome with left and right, but it's it's all the same methodology, just providing uh, that that level of detail um, for um, breaking out the values. Um, woody uh, woody cover, herbaceous cover, non-native plant cover, hydrophytic vegetation cover. All of these are um, observed aerial. Uh, readings of uh, vegetation cover, and I think anybody who's ever done any type of vegetation um, monitoring data collection has probably done this type of visual assessment, visual observations of percent cover. Most of these are broken out by strata or layer. So there will be a lower ground level layer, which is less than um, a half a meter. There will be a mid-level um, understory layer, which is half a meter to five meters in height. And then there will be a uh, overstory uh, canopy layer, which will be anything greater than five meters high. These plots will also be broken out um, into nested plots and um, and there's a diagram of this uh, as an example in the user manual. The herbaceous cover will be collected in a one by one meter plot. And these are scaled to um, account for the size and frequency of the species in which you're counting. And so herbaceous information will be collected in a one by one meter plot. Um, grubs and tall herbs will be collected in uh, a five by five meter plot, which is the understory category. And then the overstory canopy layer will be collected in a 10 by 10 meter plot. And these uh, to allow for um, hmm. data collection, um, as long as you calibrate your cases, you can case out the five by five and 10 by 10 meter plots. So that, that helps things move along much more quickly. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, for those who want to utilize the um, rapid assessment, um, that focuses on collection of the riparian width ratio, woody vegetation cover, herbaceous cover, non-native plant cover. And then um, hydrophytic vegetation cover, stem density, and green line stability are additional uh, metrics that can be very valuable, but they are uh, more 
We do not have data sheets to cover hydrophytic vegetation, stem density, and green line available yet. Uh, those will be developed in time. But information, if you're interested in testing these methods, um, this data can be collected pretty easily. Hydrophytic vegetation cover can actually be collected on a Corps of Engineers um, delineation uh, uh, determination form, wetland determination form that has the, the same sort of formatting. Um, you could collect the data on that. Stem density is basically um, cross-hatching, counting of woody stems within the 10 by 10 meter plot. And then a green line stability rating. Uh, it, uh, you can go directly to uh, the original source um, for green line uh, data collection, which is um, Winwood's, uh, I believe, 2000 publication, which has data sheets included in that particular technical document. Um, or if you're affiliated with BLM or associate or familiar with BLM methodology, um, their NIM multiple indicator monitoring techniques. Uh, their, um, their techniques and forms can also be used. Thanks, Paige. Okay, well, let's open it up. Any questions from folks? Well, I think that there's been a couple questions that have come through on the chat. Um, maybe we can go through those first and then um, and then take questions from folks. Okay, you want to go over those? Sure. So um, the first question is, um, does it mesh with the NHD? I'm assuming that's the National Hydrography data set. Um, and, and Dennis, maybe you want to jump in. You've had a couple questions. Did you want to ask them? Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I was I was just curious because um, there's already uh, several uh, methods that are already looking at a lot of this uh, sort of data, and um, I just rather than reinventing the wheel, it'd be, it'd be nice to be able to use existing data. So as a as a general comment, yes, there are you know like green line stability rating is an existing assessment. You know there there are a number of existing assessment methods that are used to collect the field information that's put into the tool. So in in that regard, I often think of this almost more as a calculator, a a lift and loss calculator rather than a straight up stream assessment method for that very reason it, it is it we 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 did try to do that as much as possible take things that people are already doing and then take that information and put it into this tool there are some things that are unique but i'd say more often than not it's using existing methods okay would it be possible to to use um, existing data within the computer rather than going out and select and uh, gathering fresh data to to apply the <clears throat> calculator to existing data forms such as MIM, which has a uh, which has a, a data form. I think it in some cases yes. I mean, you'll see that for some of these metrics, it actually suggests doing that if data was already collected to use that. Um, I think part of it will depend on the purpose of using the tool. So if it is a little bit of a bigger picture planning effort, site selection, trying to get a feel for if a site could generate enough lift to make it a good mitigation site, for example, I think that's exactly what you would want to do. Um, if it isn't, and I, you know, Paige and Julia, you guys should chime in here because some of this will end up being more of a policy decision about when when should that shift occur from using existing published data to using site specific data but i think you know for mitigation sites we would ex i think it varies by parameter but we'll see that shift occur certainly for some okay then what, what exactly is lift so lift is, is the delta so let me go back is up that, if you're still looking at the okay, screen is that 
Okay, is that the, the delta in the ranking? So if you look, if look at your screen, you'll see this functional change summary. So there's an existing condition score here of 0.33. That's essentially a quality score. It's showing that we are functioning, that this reach is at, you know, basically point at like 33% of reference condition. The proposed is very high at 0.86, 86% of, of reference. It is at reference condition. The first measure of lift is the 0.53, which is just the difference in the condition scores. But that's not okay. very useful. That's useful to let you know the quality lift, the quality improvement. But as we move into crediting that length, the scale becomes important. So that's why I put a little bit more focus on the functional foot. The functional feet, so that existing functional foot here is the 0.33 times the 1,000, and then the proposed is the 0 0.86 times the 1,200. So you have, <clears throat> this This is lift, or delta is the 702, which is the 1032 after minus the existing function, because this, keep in mind, this is this tool is meant to fit within the mitigation regulation where credit is the lift that's what a credit is credit is the difference the conditional or functional difference between the restored condition and the existing condition and so this is this is aligned with that policy okay and then also why uh was the uh the functional functional at risk and proper functioning condition divided into thirds was that just a convenient number yeah, that happened way before the quantification tool. So that was way back when we were doing the stream functions pyramid framework. <clears throat> we picked the three buckets. Um, you know, it does vary. Some indices use three, some use four, some use five. So yeah, we, we went, you know, I guess the most common is a four, sort of a quartile. If I had it to do over again, I might do that. But the three does give us a little bit, I guess, bigger bins to put that in. However, once we did the zero to one scale, we could actually have done away with those categories. Um, with discussions with this IRT and, and actually all the others, people did not want to do away with it because it does give that, it gives, I guess, supporting information to the number. It gives adds communication value. Okay. Hi, Lucy. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, that's okay, uh, Lucy. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna take. There was one more question on the chat, and then we can open it up, and you can ask your question. Is that cool? Oh yeah, totally. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we did have a question from Peter Skidmore. He wanted to know um, when the updated Wyoming stream mitigation procedures will be available for review, and what that period that review period will look like. Um, Paige, oh. did you want to briefly? answer that question? Sure. So uh, once we get the comments back um, from this particular public notice, um, which is a 90-day public notice, and um, that um, expires on uh, November 4th, um, the, the team will be evaluating those comments, and then we will be making uh, any appropriate changes to uh, the stream quantification tool and uh, evaluating its official um, release and integration into the Wyoming Regulatory Office uh, program uh, for the Corps. And um, at that time, as we're reviewing um, the final um, or the first official release of the uh, Wyoming Stream um, quantification tool, we will also be um, reworking the Wyoming Stream mitigation procedure so that it will incorporate, accurately incorporate um, this tool as part of the procedure. Um, it, we will probably have some policy shifts in that document as well. Um, uh, at this time, um, we had not planned to submit that for public review. Um, we were planning on just providing the next version, version two, um, as um, as an update to the document. 
if uh, if there are um, I guess um, any any comments or concerns regarding that certainly incorporate that uh, into your comments for this particular document and and I'll just jump in and say that um, there's a there's a couple pieces I think in the public comment period for this beta version of the quantification tool to pay attention to given how it will inform policy um, the first is that the tool uh, one of the new pieces of the Wyoming Stream Quantification Tool that was not included in the North Carolina tool is a debit tool function. And I think, you know, providing feedback and comment on the debit tool and how the debit tool answers the question of functional loss is, is very useful feedback to provide to us. And then also the output of the Stream Quantification Tool is this functional foot uh, score. And, you know, currently the Wyoming stream mitigation procedures use the linear foot of stream as the base unit for informing crediting and debiting. And I think that the intention is to move towards the functional foot score as being that base unit to inform debiting and crediting. And so I think that those are two pieces of, you know, um, the stream quantification tool and how it integrates into policy that would be useful to get feedback on during this public comment period. And now we can open it up. Lucy, did you want, did you have a question? Yeah, and um, it might be a very simple answer, but um, Will, could you scroll over uh, to the right a little bit so I can see what that says above the 702? Okay, so, um, and I apologize if you guys went over this early, we were a little bit um, late getting on the call. Um, but if I'm understanding this correctly, say this is a mitigation project. So am I understanding that from doing these activities and the functional change summary, you would get essentially 702 credits if you were thinking about it like a mitigation bank? Yes, um, but maybe not fully. So the policy, you know, Paige, you may want to answer this more than me but so this is the functional lift piece of the credit but there could be other things that are added to this to get the full amount of credits okay right. so the wyoming stream mitigation procedure um i don't know if, if many of you are familiar with that particular document but there are different um uh, policy and ecological factors that are taken into consideration um, when we are looking at um, um, uh, functional loss uh, or functional loss as a result of uh, a Department of the Army permitted project, and we're looking at um, mitigation, compensatory mitigation of those losses. And so um, there's some of the different things that we try to factor in from the policy perspective may change this um, basic or base unit, uh, this functional foot unit um, that is ultimately uh, applied in the permitting situation. Um, for example, um, um, uh, with regard to mitigation, if mitigation is, um, for example, conducted outside the watershed in which the impacts occur, there may be um, uh, a, a, dedu a deduction in um, or in addition to uh, the debits or um, uh, the credit obligation uh, that is present for the permittee. Um, or if on the positive side, if, um, if mitigation is conducted um, well in advance of a project, um, then there would be additional credit um, provided in that circumstance. Um, because you no longer have the assumed temporal losses associated with with those stream functional losses. So those are the types of policy issues that we're still trying to account for and intertwine and address in this 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 overriding Wyoming stream mitigation procedure document that will come out 
after um, the finalization of the Wyoming quantification tool. So there is another Thanks. question that comes through the chat. Um, sorry, Lucy, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just I was just saying thank you for uh, for answering the question. Okay. Um, so there is another question that came in on the chat from Tina Kruger. She asked, please clarify how this tool will be integrated into the Wyoming Regulatory Office protocol for permitting under nationwide permits. Paige, can you address that question? Sure, um, sort of. <laughs> that that also comes. Those are. Um, specifics that will also be outlined in the Wyoming stream mitigation procedure. Um, we will uh, give some thought and evaluate to, to what extent um, this tool is required for nationwide permits. And so nationwide permits are, um, are, uh, are available or authorized for projects that involve minimal impacts. And so um, in, in order for project to qualify, those projects do need to be minimal, but sometimes they do require mitigation. So um, we, will, we will give um, um, some extra scrutiny with regard to how we implement the program. Um, and uh, our emphasis will likely be that um, the application of the tool would be commensurate with the scope and scale of the project. For additional guidance. <laughs> Hi, this is Carla DeMasters from Westerville Ecological Services. Will, could you talk a little bit about applying this tool to larger order streams um, like the North Platte um, and any of the parameters that well, we would want to pay special attention to? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the parameters that we listed would, you know, in terms of recommended that they are required and those common metrics would still apply to, to larger rivers. I mean, we have some data and have played with the tool certainly in hundreds of square miles and one in, two, in thousands of square miles. Um, that I think the one issue you would get is you get really big. We would, you know, if, if most of the data to create the performance standards were from rivers that were, you know, quite a bit smaller, we'd want to do a little bit of calibration to see if, okay, are we getting similar pool spacing ratios, for example, in rivers of that size compared to where we have. But I think the metrics listed would stay the same. You still have to determine the restoration potential part. So as you're working in huge watersheds that have lots of alterations, your potential for bringing your, you know, even if it's a mile long or two miles long or three miles long, your potential for getting to level five is pretty low. So I do think those projects are gonna be more, if, if it's in a you know a watershed with a lot of alterations, you're gonna be more along the lines of the restoration potential of level three. And if that's the case, you don't need to measure physical, chemical, and biology metrics. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Do any folks have any additional questions who are on the line? Uh, this is Pete Godfrey in Wyoming, uh, in Cheyenne. Um, do you have any plans to include ephemeral reaches in, uh, in this? And if you don't, uh, uh, does that mean that they won't be included in any mitigation efforts? Okay, I'll start. I, yes, we would. We definitely we have a little bit of ephemeral data, just not a lot. So we would like to. We definitely would like to improve the performance standards for ephemeral 
stream so that the tool does um, accurately, you know, score lift and loss in ephemeral channels. I'll let Paige and talk about whether they would be included in, in the policy side. I think the potential exists for it to apply in, for ephemeral channels. Um, as Will indicated, it's it's uh, we do have limited data on that. Um, the way we're envisioning this applying um, from a policy perspective is we will um, mitigation um, can can always uh, be conducted from uh, an in kind um, perspective. So if you are in, um, if you are impacting an, an ephemeral stream, an ephemeral stream system, um, you can certainly offset those losses and impacts by um, mitigating in an ephemeral stream system. So we want to be able to capture that particular scenario, um, and and that would likely be uh, captured again uh, from a policy perspective in in the Wyoming Stream Mitigation Procedure document. Um, and again, we will, uh, we will rely on uh, folks who are, who are testing uh, this particular quantitative tool. Um, if they are interested in collecting data in ephemeral systems, we welcome that data. Um, we welcome um, data being submitted to our office um, for, for any application of this particular tool because uh, that data will just help better inform the back end or the performance standards on which the tool is based. So I hope I hope that kind of answers your question, Peter. Uh, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Grant from United Ecosystem Services out of Northern Colorado. So, my primary question would be, um, I guess, for Will, regarding time frame of detailed methodology um, versus the rapid assessment. And I, 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 I tend to agree that most of these would be level three. So let's talk level three because I was looking at level four and level five, which um, seem to require a couple of years of data. But let's just talk level three, which most mitigation. We probably fall under, and what what do you see as time frame for detailed data collection? I I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear the the question part. So I know it's about rapid versus detailed for level three, but I, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes. What what time frame you would anticipate for detailed collection at a level three? Oh, gotcha. So yeah. like if you go out to a reach, how long is it going to take you to do a detailed assessment? Yes. Well, obviously it depends on how big the reach is, but we typically, let's just say you have a reach that's 1,500 feet in length, you know, it's got pretty good visibility. We could do the detailed assessment in a day. The biggest difference between the detailed assessment and the rapid assessment is that the detailed assessment is including a, the, a, a survey instrument. You know, instead of just measuring pool spacing, you're going to do a longitudinal profile. You're going to do cross sections. So I typically just say a reach per day. Now that can vary if it's a really woolly reach with a lot of willows and it's a pain in the butt, then it might be a little bit longer. but on the flip side, if it's more of a prairie setting and you can see and set up and, you know, it, it maybe if it's quite degraded, then you could do, you know, two reaches in a day. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hi, this is uh, this is Lucy in uh, in Westerveld in Denver again. Um, so, just to just to wrap my head fully around this, so is the expectation that this functional assessment will be done on the impact side as well as the mitigation side as part of the um, the permitting process? 
So there's a, that's a big question. So there's a lot in the document on that. So so through level three, rapid assessment, most of the time, yes, that assessment would take place for the existing condition on the impact side. And then there's a variety of options to to determining the proposed condition. So if you if you look through that chapter, you'll see sort of the different steps to go through fr from actually no assessments at all and making some assumptions of values uh, that will ensure no net loss to more sophisticated ways of estimating those values. So Will, we have another question from the chat um, okay. regarding the uh, the stability of river systems, um, so the endpoint being more bank stabilization or static channels, and the issue that in western streams a lot of alluvial rivers are fundamentally dependent on dynamic processes of erosion and deposition. So the question is, can you point to aspects of the tool that account for or promote the necessary dy dynamism rather than promoting bank stabilization or static channels? Well, I think that's built into the performance standards. You know, we're not, um, I mean, these these data came from those rivers. So yeah, I mean, we're certainly not trying to promote a method that uses <clears throat> fancier ways or things other than riprap just to harden channels in place. <clears throat> so if you, know, if you look at kind of a dynamic equilibrium, if that stream is moving on its landscape, so the the cross section is remaining similar, but its but its position is changing, and so the pool spacing is remaining in, within that range. It's just its location is not. We don't have on the bank erosion example. We we don't have performance standards that that are requiring no erosion. Like it's there there certainly can be sediment supply from lateral migration. I, I, you know, I will point out again, though, that this this tool is not, I mean, especially if, if they're thinking braided systems that are very dynamic, this tool is not a braided channel tool at this point. It, it is more of a single thread channel centric tool. I don't know if that was implied in the question or not. And so I'll just also say that one of the things that we are specifically looking for in this beta testing and public comment period is the applicability of the, this tool in different stream types in Wyoming. And I think particularly if there are certain examples or certain stream types or areas of Wyoming where there may be better metrics to assess the functioning of systems, particularly maybe getting at systems where maybe bedform diversity is not as important as other more dynamic components of the system, you know, what additional metrics or what stratification of performance standards may be useful for us to consider as we improve this tool for Wyoming resources. That is something And the that ephemeral are... channel is a good example. I mean, from my experience of, of sampling and measuring ephemeral channels, the, the bed form diversity metric may go away. It's, you don't really see pool spacing and diversity of of kind of depth and as you move into these ephemeral systems and so that that may be one example of a, of a metric that's required in these perennial to intermittent systems but not in the in the ephemeral Do we have any other questions? And I am, just so everyone knows, I am recording some of the comments and feedback that have come in through the chat um, so that we can put them in the in the record for the public notice period. All right, are we ready to wrap up? I think so. Will, would you mind um, putting the uh, the slide with the um, web link on it for the sure. documents? Just to wrap things up and so people know where that can be found.
Thanks again for your participation, everyone. And um, we really appreciate your time today and any time that you can put on um, uh, providing feedback um, on any Could elements. Scroll down of on this the slide. Could you scroll down they on the can't slide? Read the bottom of the slide. I, I can advance the slide, but there, it's it's in presentation mode, so it may be something on your screen. But the just the web address is stream-mechanics.com. Take it out of presentation mode, and we should be able to see the link. That help? Yes, it does. All right, cool. All right. For your we look forward to your comments. Thank you all. Thank you.